I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Pakistan to introduce an address by the head of government. Mr. President, I have the great honor to introduce a recorded statement by His Excellency Mr. Imran Khan, the Prime Minister of the Islamic Republic of Pakistan. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Iyaka na'abado wa iyaka na'astayin. Mr. President, I congratulate you on assuming the presidency of the 76th session of the General Assembly. I also wish to express appreciation for the significant achievements of your predecessor, Volkan Bosker, who guided the Assembly skillfully under the difficult circumstances imposed by the COVID-19 pandemic. Mr. President, the world is facing triple challenge of the COVID-19, the accompanying economic crisis, and the threats posed by climate change. The virus does not discriminate between nations and people, nor do the catastrophes imposed by uncertain weather patterns. The common threats faced by us today not only expose the fragility of the international system, they also underscore the oneness of humanity. By the grace of Almighty Allah, Pakistan has been successful so far in containing the COVID pandemic. Our collaborated strategy of smart lockdowns helped save lives and livelihoods and kept the economy afloat. Over 15 million families survived through a social protection program of SAS. Mr. President, climate change is one of the primary existential threats that our planet faces today. Pakistan's contribution to global emissions is negligible, yet we are among the 10 most vulnerable countries to the effects of climate change in the world. Being fully aware of our global responsibilities, we have embarked upon game-changing environmental programs, reforesting Pakistan through our 10 billion tree tsunami, preserving natural habitats, switching to re renewable energy, removing pollution from our cities, and adapting to the impacts of climate change. To address the triple crisis of COVID pandemic, economic downturn, and climate emergency, we need a, a comprehensive strategy that should include, number one, vaccine equity. Everyone, everywhere, must be vaccinated against COVID and as soon as possible. Two, adequate financing must be made available to developing countries. This can be ensured through comprehensive debt restructuring, expanded ODA, redistribution of unutilized SDRs, and allotment of a greater proportion of SDRs to developing countries. And finally, provision of climate finance. Three, we must adopt clear investment strategies which help alleviate poverty, promote job creation, build sustainable infrastructure, and of course, bridge the digital divide. I propose that the Secretary General convene an SDG summit in 2025 to review and ac accelerate implementation of sustainable development goals. Mr. President, because of the plunder of the developing world by their corrupt ruling elites, the gap between the rich and the poor countries is increasing at an alarming speed. Through this platform, I've been drawing the world's attention towards the scourge of illicit financial flows from developing countries. The Secretary General's high-level panel of financial accountability, transparency, and integrity 
called the FACTI panel, has calculated that a staggering $7 trillion in stolen assets are parked in financial haven destinations. This organized theft and illegal transfer of assets has profound consequences for the developing nations. It depletes the already meager resources, accentuates the levels of poverty, especially when laundered money puts pressure on the currency and leads to its devaluation. At the current rate, when the FACTI panel estimates that a trillion dollars every year is taken out of, of the developing world, there will be a mass exodus of economic migrants towards the richer nations. What the East India Company did to India, the crooked ruling elites are doing to the developing world, plundering the wealth and transferring it to Western capitals and offshore tax havens. And Mr. President, retrieving the stolen assets from the developed countries is impossible for poor nations. The rich countries have no incentives or compulsion to return this ill-gotten Ill wealth. And this ill-gotten wealth belongs, remember, to the masses of the developing world. I foresee in the not too distant future, a time will come when the rich countries will be forced to build walls to keep out economic migrants from these poor countries. I fear a few wealthy islands in the sea of poverty will also turn into a global calamity like climate change. The General Assembly must take steps meaningfully to address this deeply disturbing and morally repugnant situation, naming and shaming the haven destinations and developing a comprehensive legal framework to halt and reverse the illicit financial flows are most critical actions to stop this great economic injustice. And at a minimum, the recommendations of the Secretary General's FACTI panel should be fully implemented. Mr. President, Islamophobia is another pernicious phenomena that we all need to collectively combat. In the aftermath of the 9-11 terrorist attacks, terrorism has been associated with Islam by some quarters. This has increased the tendency of right-wing xenophobic and violent nationalist extremists and terrorist groups to target Muslims. The UN Global Counterterrorism Strategy has recognized these emerging threats. We hope the Secretary General's report will focus on these new threats of terrorism posed by Islamophobes and right-wing extremists. I call on the Secretary General to convene a global dialogue on countering the rise of Islamophobia. Our parallel efforts at the same time should be to promote interfaith harmony and they should continue. Mr. President, the worst and most pervasive form of Islamophobia now rules India. The hate-filled Hinduvta ideology propagated by the fascist RSS BJP regime has unleashed a reign of fear and violence against India's 200 million Muslim strong community. Mob lynching by cow vigilantes, frequent pogroms such as the one in New Delhi last year, discriminatory citizenship laws to purge India of Muslims, and a campaign to destroy mosques across India and obliterate its Muslim heritage and history are all part of this criminal enterprise. New Delhi has also embarked on what it ominously calls the final solution for Jammu and Kashmir dispute. It has undertaken a series of illegal and unilateral measures in occupied Jammu and Kashmir since 5th August 2019. It has unleashed a reign of terror 
by an occupation force of 900,000. It has jailed senior Kashmiri leadership, imposed a, a clampdown on media and internet, violently suppressed peaceful protest, abducted 13,000 young Kashmiris and tortured hundreds of them. It has extrajudicially killed hundreds of innocent Kashmiris in fake encounters and imposed collective punishments by destroying entire neighborhoods and villages. We had unveiled a detailed dossier on gross and systematic violations of human rights by the Indian security forces in occupied Jammu and Kashmir. This repression is accompanied by illegal efforts to change the demographic structure of the occupied territory and transform it from a Muslim majority into a Muslim minority. Indian actions violate the resolutions of the United Nations Security Council on Jammu and Kashmir. They clearly prescribe, the resolutions clearly prescribe that the final disposition of the disputed territory should be decided by its people through a free and impartial plebiscite held under the UN auspices. India's action in occupied Jammu and Kashmir also violate international human rights and humanitarian laws, including the Fourth Geneva Convention, and amount to war crimes and crimes against humanity. It is unfortunate, very unfortunate, that the world's approach to violations of human rights lack even-handedness. And even are selective. Geopolitical considerations or corporate interests, commercial interests, often compel major powers to overlook the transgressions of their affiliated countries. Such double standards, and the most glaring in case of India, where this RSS BJP regime is being allowed to get away with human rights abuses with complete immunity. The most recent example of Indian barbarity was the forcible snatching of the mortal remains of the great Kashmiri leader, Sayyid Ali Shah Gilani, from his family, denying him a proper Islamic funeral and burial in accordance with his wishes and the Muslim tradition. Devoid of any legal or moral sanction, this action has been against the basic norms of human decency. I call on this General Assembly to demand that Sayyid Gilani's mortal remains be allowed to be buried in the Cemetery of Martyrs with the appropriate Islamic rites. Mr. President, Pakistan desires peace with India as with all its neighbors. But sustainable peace in South Asia is contingent upon resolution of the Jammu and Kashmir dispute in accordance with the relevant United Nations Security Council resolutions and the wishes of the Kashmiri people. Last February, we reaffirmed the 2003 ceasefire understanding along the line of control. The hope was that it would lead to a rethink of the strategy in Delhi. Sadly, the BJP government has intensified repression in Kashmir and conti continues to vitiate the environment by these barbaric acts. The onus remains on India to create a conducive environment for meaningful and result-oriented engagement with Pakistan. And for that, it must do, number one, reverse its unilateral and illegal measures instituted since 5th August 2019. Secondly, stop its oppression and human rights violations against the people of Kashmir. And three, halt and reverse the demographic changes in the occupied territory. It is also essential to prevent another conflict between Pakistan and India. India's military buildup, development of advanced nuclear weapons, and acquisition of destabilizing conventional capabilities can erode mutual deterrence between the two countries. And now, Mr. President, I want to talk about Afghanistan. 
the current situation in Afghanistan, for some reason, Pakistan has been blamed for the turn of events by politicians in the United States and some politicians in Europe. From this platform, I want them all to know the country that suffered the most, apart from Afghanistan, was Pakistan when we joined the U.S. war on terror after 9-11. 80,000 Pakistanis died. $150 billion was lost to our economy. There were three and a half million internally displaced Pakistanis. And why did this happen? In the 80s, Pakistan was a frontline state in fighting against the occupation of Afghanistan. Pakistan and the United States trained Mujahideen groups to fight for the liberation of Afghanistan. Amongst those Mujahideen groups were Al-Qaeda, were various groups from all over the world. They were Mujahideen, Afghan Mujahideen. These were considered heroes. President Ronald Reagan invited them to White House in 1983. And according to news items, he compared them to the founding fathers of the United States. They were heroes. Come 1989, the Soviets leave. So do the Americans, abandon Afghanistan. Pakistan is, was left with five million Afghan refugees. We were left with sectarian militant groups which never existed before. But the worst cut of it was that a year later, Pakistan was sanctioned by the US. We felt used. Fast forward 9-11, Pakistan is needed again by the US because now the US-led coalition is now invading Afghanistan and it could not happen without Pakistan providing all the logistical support. What happened after that? The same Mujahideen that we had trained that fighting foreign occupation was a sacred duty, a holy war or jihad, they turned against us. We were called collaborators. They declared jihad on us. Then all along the tribal belt bordering Afghanistan, the Pakistan semi-autonomous tribal belt, where no Pakistan army had been since our independence. They had strong sympathies with, with the Taliban, Afghan Taliban, not because of their religious ideology, but because of Pashtun nationalism, which is very strong. Then there were three million Afghan refugee, refugees still in Pakistan, all Pashtuns, living in camps, 500,000, the biggest camp, 100,000 camps. They all had affinity and sympathies with the with the Afghan Taliban. So what happened? They too turned against Pakistan. For the first time, we had militant Taliban in Pakistan. And they called, and they too attacked Pakistan government. When our army went in to, in the tribal areas for the first time in our history, whenever an army goes into civilian areas, there, there's collateral damage. So there was collateral damage which multiplied the militants to seek revenge. But not just that. The world must know that Pakistan, in Pakistan, there were 480 drone attacks conducted by the US. 480 drone attacks. And we all know that drone attacks are not that precise. They cause more collateral damage than the than the militants they are targeting. So, who did the people who were, who were, whose relatives were being killed, who did they seek revenge against Pakistan? Between 2004 and 2014, there were 50 different militant groups attacking the state of Pakistan. At one point, people, people like us were worried that will we survive this? There were bombs going all over Pakistan. Our capital was 
like a fortress. Had it not been for one of the most disciplined army in the world and one of the best intelligence agencies in the world, I, I think Pakistan would have gone down. So when we hear this at the end, the, there's a lot of worry about use in the US about taking care of the people who helped them, the interpreters and everyone who helped the US. What about us? The only reason we suffered so much was because we became an ally of the US, of the coalition in the war against Afghanistan, where there were attacks being conducted from Afghan soil into Pakistan. At least there should have been a, a word of appreciation. But rather than appreciation, imagine how we feel when we are blamed for, for this, the turn of events in Afghanistan. After 2006, it became apparent to everyone who understood Afghanistan's and Af Afghanistan's history that the, there would be no military solution in Afghanistan. I went to the US, I spoke to think tanks, I met President, uh, at the time Senator Biden, Senator John Kerry, Senator Harry Reid. I tried to explain to them that there would not be any military solution and political settlement was the way to go forward. No one understood then. And unfortunately, in trying to force a military solution is where US went wrong. And if today, if and if today, the world needs to know why the Taliban are back in power, all the world has to do is do a deep analysis of why 300,000 well-equipped Afghan army, and remember Afghans are one of the bravest nations on earth, why did this 300,000 Afghan army give up without a fight? The, the moment a deep analysis of this is done, the world would know why the Taliban are back in power and it's not because of Pakistan. So Mr. President, right now, the whole world community should think, what is the way ahead? There are two paths we can take. If we neglect Afghanistan right now, according to the UN, half, half the people of Afghanistan are already vulnerable. And by next year, Almost 90% of people in Afghanistan will go below the poverty line. There's a huge humanitarian crisis looming ahead. And this will have serious repercussions, not just for the neighbors of Afghanistan, but it will have repercussions everywhere if a destabilized, a chaotic Afghanistan again becomes a safe haven for international terrorists. The reason why the US came to to Afghanistan in the first place. So therefore, there is only one way to go. We must strengthen this current government, stabilize it for the sake of the people of Afghanistan. What have the Taliban promised? They will respect human rights. They will have an inclusive government. They will not allow the soil to be used by terrorists. And they have given amnesty. Now, if the world community incentivizes them, encourages them to walk this talk, it will be a win-win situation for everyone. Because these are the four things that in Doha, when the US was talking to the Tal Taliban, these were the conditions they were, the dialogue was all about. So if the world can uh, incentivize them to go this direction, then after all, this 20 year of, of, of presence, of coalition presence in Afghanistan would not be wasted because Afghan soil would not be used for international terrorism. So I end my talk, uh, Mr. President, by urging everyone that this is a critical time for Afghanistan. You cannot waste time. Help is needed there. Humanitarian assistance has to be given there immediately. And uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations has taken bold steps 
I urge you to mobilize the international community and move in this direction. Thank you. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the Prime Minister of the Islamic Republic of Pakistan for the statement uh, just made. The Assembly will hear an address by His Excellency Irakli Garibashvili, Prime Minister of Georgia. May I request protocol to escort His Excellency.